company Cyrus R. Vance, Jr. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Albany Law School, Ms. Lowy has been employed as an, <clears throat> as an assistant district attorney in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office for over 29 years. So is that over, or over 30? Did you make? Just short, just short, of, 30. Just short of 30 years. Well, who's counting? That's right. Under former District Attorney Robert Morgenthau, she oversaw the Domestic Violence Unit from 1990 until 1995, before assisting in the creation of the office's Elder Abuse Program, which evolved into the current Elder Abuse Unit of 18 prosecutors. In 2009, Ms. Lowy served as trial counsel in a high-profile trial involving the late Brooke Astor after initiating and leading the investigation of Mrs. Astor's son, Anthony Marshall, and his attorney, Francis Morrissey. The trial resulted in convictions as to both defendants, which you'll hear about, and they were upheld on appeal. She also led the criminal investigation into the affairs of the late Uget Clark, a reclusive philanthropist whose estate became the subject of another highly publicized will contest, though no criminal charges were filed. And I do want to say this that no one wants to be the victim of elder abuse, but New York City was a better place to be a victim because of what Liz Lowy has done and continues to do. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, and I know that sounds like a backhanded compliment, but it's not. It is, it's a better place uh, for it. So let's welcome Liz. It was a long six months, so I'm very protective of those months. In fact, my daughter, who was, I don't know, 10 or 11, right around the time of the trial, told me she was going out for Halloween as Brooke Astor. I knew I had a problem. <laughs> At any rate, I am one of the prosecutors on the case. Um, first, uh, I want to thank my Fernandez, um, Josh Bales, and certainly Ron Long from Wells Fargo. Um, not that much has been said about Wells Fargo and Ron's unit, which is really groundbreaking and has done amazing work bringing together prosecutors, law enforcement, adult protective services workers, uh, and the bank. Um, and he's taken a leadership role. Um, his importance really can't be overstated. So, so thank you, Ron. It, you know, I've, I've lived a long life in the area of elder abuse. For a bank to be so involved is terrific. Um, about elder financial abuse. You know, I used to be in charge of the domestic violence unit, and I've heard people say, elder financial abuse, it's not as serious as other types of crime. You know, there may not be physical violence, as we've heard. There may not be a gun or, or a knife or another weapon. There may not be blood or stitches or visible bruises. There's no autopsy. And for some victims, Dementia has left them so debilitated that they really don't have a full sense of what's going on, depending on how bad the dementia is. So who cares, right? If a close friend or even a family member or even an only son or an only daughter takes their mom or their dad's or their grandparents' cash or valuable assets like jewelry or a favorite painting or even their home, who cares, right? What if there's a will that's been kept in place for a few years or even a decade or even decades? Who cares if that son or daughter decides that once their parent is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, that they can come in and change that estate plan and change that will? Who cares, right, if they don't even have a full sense of what's going on? This is what a lot of folks ask me during this case. Even one of the people involved in the banking part of this, who was the head of a hedge fund, who cares if she didn't know what was going on, that he changed her will? So this is what happened to Mrs. Astor. And if it happened to Mrs. Astor, as you've heard suggested previously, it can happen to anyone, right? She had millions. She dressed well. She had what appeared to be the perfect life. But like all cases involving elder financial abuse, and family members or other relatives, trust me, it's about greed. It's about that sense of entitlement. And it's about folks out there who don't realize, just like was true in domestic violence 20 years ago, that if you're a family member and if you take cash or other assets without permission of your relative, of your elder, of your mom or your dad or your grandparent, it can be viewed as criminal. So that's really what elder financial abuse is about, make no mistake about it, it is devastating to victims, 
and victims' loved ones, as we saw today. Philip is a survivor. You could see how difficult it was to talk about this. You didn't see black eyes or bruises with Mrs. Astor or blood or guts or what we see on some of those law and order shows, right? As I've heard from so many survivors, like Philip, so many survivors of elder financial abuse, this is really a devastating crime. Studies have shown, some scientific studies have shown, that it does indeed shorten the lifespan of victims. Many of them can't go on. They can't buy... Uh, they can't afford medical care or prescriptions. They lose their housing. So, of course, uh, it's natural and understandable that uh, lifespans and certainly quality of, of life uh, are diminished. And the emotional toll that this takes upon victims, even victims who have dementia, I I've seen the results and I've seen the effects of elder financial abuse. I do believe that even with demented victims, that the betrayal is just a huge, huge factor. Um, the despair that comes with that betrayal, whether it's a family member or an aide or a financial professional who does the exploiting, I do believe that these victims simply lose the will to live and to go on. And so we have the case involving Mrs. Astor. And for those of you who, who like visuals, there are a few pictures here that I'm going to show you that related to the trial. Meryl Gordon, in her book, and certainly Philip, have dis pretty much described the backdrop of this case. I couldn't possibly tell you all about you, you know, all about what happened in this case from the beginning of the guardianship proceeding to the referral to my office to the investigation. I couldn't tell you about all of the aspects of of this. I didn't read Merrill Gordon's book until I had interviewed most of the witnesses because I didn't want to confuse what she had written with what the witnesses were telling me. But here you see the characters. This is Mrs. Astor. As you've heard, she was the grand dame of New York. For those of you who've visited Manhattan, you may have been lucky enough to stay at the Waldorf Astoria. Maybe a couple of you. I've never stayed there, but how about Astor Place subway station? Anyone ever stopped at Astor Place? There are just numerous landmarks named after the Astor family and named after Vincent Astor and Mrs. Astor, who said she thought money is like manure. It needs to be spread around. She loved philanthropy. She loved getting out there and, and giving her money away. And if you can look at this, this, this trial was unique in that it was a unique set of, it was like a cast of characters, you know? Mrs. Astor and her son, so pr patrician, he would wear like an ascot, is that what you call that scarf, to court? He, a criminal court is a disgusting place, right? He came in with his wife, Charlene, you know, quite a few years younger. The press was horrible to her. But they just didn't believe in the dirty criminal court area. I, I believe that they were just amazed that criminal charges were being brought against him. So this is Mrs. Astor and her only son, Anthony Marshall. He, as Merrill told you, he was her financial advisor. He made $450,000 a year for what witnesses described as going to an office for about 10 to 20 minutes a week, okay, to handle finances that were really already being, being handled by folks from from firms, um, hedge, hedge fund advisors, and, and other places. So it's not as though he was uh, destitute. He made that money. He was also her power of attorney. And by the way, although this case involved millions, this is what we see in cases that involves a, a couple hundred. Family members who exploit. Sometimes a family member is a POA, sometimes maybe even working for the senior. And he was a senior himself, as you can see. So many of our elder financial abuse cases do involve older defendants, you know, and there was some criticism I heard about later that we were prosecuting a man in his 80s, but my feeling is you do the crime, you do the time. This is Mrs. Astor out and about. You know, one of the amazing things about Brooke Astor, if you've never heard about her, was she was just uh, an incredible uh, philanthropist because she believed that you should always dress up. So if she was going to a, a wealthy neighborhood or a neighborhood that was, had more indigent folks, she always dressed to the nines, you know, wearing fancy jewelry, long gloves, beautiful clothes, and here she is out and about doing her philanthropy. She loved it. She wasn't someone who was just going to, after Vincent died, you know, sit in bed and have truffles and do her nails and write checks. She wanted to get out to the charities. 
whether it was a big charity or a small charity, she wanted to see where the money was going and to see the effects of her philanthropy. So hopefully you guys have been to New York. Maybe you've been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That was one of her favorite institutions. This is the New York Public Library. She was also a, a big giver to the public library and plenty of smaller institutions as well. Now, I told you you don't see a lot of blood and guts and bruises with elder financial abuse, and I know you probably know that. You have to look for it. This is Mrs. Astor in her late 90s. Okay, this is when she was suffering from dementia, and this is when the abuse started. Who would know it, right? She's out there climbing mountains. People couldn't keep her down. She could still say, hi, how are you, and make small talk, but this is when the exploitation started at the hands of her son. As you heard, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the year 2000, and her son was there with her when she was diagnosed. And when the neurologist told, you can't know for sure about Alzheimer's until there's an autopsy, but when the neurologist told her son that his mother suffered from Alzheimer's disease, his first words were, can she still do a will? Not, tell me more about Alzheimer's, what can I do? And, and that's where we saw the trouble begin. We ordered thousands and thousands of pages of medical records. And we believe, although there's no firm proof of this, he probably planned to move for guardianship to get control of the assets at first. And this is something we found buried in medical records. It's basically a letter to one of the doctors after Marshall believes that his mother has Alzheimer's, he's been informed, telling the doctor how ill she is. Your test of purchasing an item from $10, incomprehensible. She can't do any math. So she was supposed to understand all the changes that were made to her will two and three years later as the Alzheimer's got worse. So this is basically how we prove the case, is by showing through the medical evidence and through other witnesses that he took advantage of her and changed her estate plan when she was mentally impaired. And that's basically what the case was about. He had a power of attorney. By the way, for those of you who know about powers of attorney, his power of attorney had gift, gift giving into, in it. So they used that as a defense at trial. He's allowed to give gifts, maybe true, but not gifts to himself that are exorbitant, where there's no history of gift giving like that. This was one of the court sketches during the trial. One of the things that happened to her estate plan was that they fired her longtime lawyer named Terry Christensen, they being uh, Anthony Marshall and Francis Morrissey, the lawyer he hired. And they hired a new attorney who had a codicil signed by Mrs. Astor years after she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's that basically left a $60 million residuary state that always went to charity to him and to Charlene. How many times did this new lawyer who was hired meet Mrs. Astor before going to her home and having her sign this document? Take a guess. Zero. Okay? So that's what the case was about. My elder law friends who do civil work were like, why is, why is this in criminal court? This is why. Okay? She left the room after signing this codicil, and her nurse said her first words after leaving were, what did I just sign? What did I just do? She had no idea. Who are these men? She had no clue as to what was going on. This was another codicil that was signed supposedly under the auspices of Francis Morrissey, that new attorney who was convicted, found to be a forgery. We had a handwriting expert come in and it was clear that this was a forgery. He had no doubt. How do you prove these cases? You know, they're not, no one calls you and says, you know, Miss Lowy, uh, I just called Detective Smith. I was financially exploited. My estate plan has been changed and I didn't sign checks. And, you know, this is not how cases come in. She had Alzheimer's disease, she had been diagnosed three and four years later, they're changing her state plan. Marshall gave himself a raise of over a million dollars almost four years after she was diagnosed. Remember, man making 450,000 a year, gave himself a raise of over a million and made it retroactive for a few years once she had no idea what was going on, okay? He wouldn't allow them to put a safety gate next to her bedroom. She had Alzheimer's, she wandered. He said it would diminish the look of her residence. And instead, he spent the money from his increased salary on a yacht and a skipper up in Maine, okay? While, while, while not buying a safety gate for her apartment. He came in one day and took a half a million dollar painting off the wall while Mrs. Astor was sleeping underneath it and said to the people looking at him doing this, my mother says I can have anything I want. For those of you wondering, no, he wasn't willed that painting. 
Charlene put it into a paper stop and shop bag. What do you, a grocery store paper bag, and they left with it. Witnesses testified that during the exploitation, they'd come to the apartment that used to be gorgeous with nice flowers. There was dog manure on the floor and urine around, and that her quality of life had really diminished during the time that he was stealing from her. This is her chauffeur who was fired along with some of the other employees you heard about. There was a visitor's list. This is how it's done, elder financial abuse. You isolate the senior. They as a visitor's list. Philip Marshall and his twin brother weren't on it, nor were her other close friends. This was her chauffeur who promised she loved this man. He was a handsome Italian gentleman with the accent and everything. Like I said, cast of characters, right? He promised he would never leave Mrs. Astor. He cried as he testified. The defense attorneys were horrible to him. My co-counsel, who does a lot of big press cases, was elbowing me, object, object. I said, no way. And right after that, and this is true, he yelled at a defense attorney and said, I feel sorry for you and I feel sorry for your client because he couldn't wait. He just couldn't wait, meaning Mr. Marshall, the defendant. And it was one of the more powerful moments in the trial. This is Barbara Walters. We called witnesses from all walks of life because Mrs. Astor had friends who worked at the local restaurant and she had highfalutin friends. And by the way, Francis Morrissey, not so charming to me. He complimented my clothes because Women's Wear Daily was there every day to, you know, to report on what the Barbara Walters and Annette De Laurenta, Oscar De Laurenta's wives were wearing. And I think he probably knew I lived in fear that they were going to report on what I was wearing, the only female in the room. And it was usually Macy's or Ann Taylor. But no, I, I didn't find him to be so charming. He, you know, and he was... Uh, convicted, thankfully. But Barbara Walters, some said we were just calling her because she was well known. She testified that a day before one of the codicils at issue was signed, she had her last visit with Mrs. Astor. Somehow she got around the visitors list. And what was that meeting like? There's a photograph from it. She said, I tried to talk to Brooke and all she could do was gurgle the entire time. This during the time her entire estate plan was being changed by by these lawyers and by spearheaded by Anthony Marshall and Francis Morrissey. So I think you have some sense of what happened in this trial, fortunately. They were convicted of these crimes. The crime you heard about, well, one of the charges we had about the painting that was worth several million dollars where Marshall got a $2 million con uh, commission, so-called commission for all the work he put in, there was an acquittal on that charge. Even though she had said, now can I buy dresses, the jury did acquit on that charge. Uh, other grand larceny charges, there were convictions. And they did, uh, they were sentenced to one to three, you know, pursued all their appellate remedies, and Mr. Marshall um, was remanded in June of 2013. Um, the next month, his defense attorney asked for early release because of his age, and he was released a month later. And um, I want to tell you how difficult these cases are to prove. I think you all have a sense of that. But I didn't read, it was in the paper every day. The papers were actually kind of cruel. You know, they had bad air day on the cover of the post with Anthony Marshall's hair up in the air. Get it, bad hair day, bad air day. You know, the, the, the post, if you know the New York Post and the Daily News, they, 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 can, they can be, you know, I guess funny slash awful. But I didn't read the blogs because I was worried about where the jury would go. They went out for a few days on this case. They did convict. I think anyone who saw all the evidence would have convicted, but this was a blog post. I did look the day of the convictions to see what people were saying. And this was one blog post I thought was incredibly telling. And here it is. This won't be a popular statement, but it's mine. The money in that will was family money. This wonderful and generous woman to New York didn't make it by working all her life. Oh, how do you like that, right? A little sexist, maybe? My, my parents always taught me that if you marry money, you earn it, which <laughs> which I think is true, but I wouldn't know. But anyway, I, I, didn't, I didn't even think of that take. I absolutely disagree, that's their spelling, by the means to which her son went about procuring a way into the will by fraud, period. There we go. Well, I don't agree. But why wasn't the will like that in the first place? And by the way, she was very generous to her son. But many folks want to do with their assets what they do with their assets. Some decide not to leave everything to their kids, right? 
Will shouldn't be a way to say F you from the grave. It's wonderful to want to help charity. She wanted the 60 million remaining to go to charity and not to her son who was getting millions and you know, personal property. But you should look after your own first. So I think that tells you, you know, we're probably where we were where domestic violence was 20 years ago. When I used to have the domestic violence unit, people would come in and say it's a family matter. And when I started the elder abuse unit, and even still, people will say to me, it's a kid. It's the only child. You know, she's 90. She's demented. You know, this only child is in the will. And I'll say, look at the penal law. To me, it's worse, right? But I never dreamed when I was doing this 15 years ago that I would see a room full of hundreds of people focused on elder abuse. And it really, it, I find it to be really heartening. And I, I wanted to say that the Astor case is like many cases, you know, family member, power of attorney, you know, money leaving, assets leaving. You have to look for elder financial abuse. It's not going to come into your office and report it to you. It's often there with other types of crime. And I just wanted to say that uh, I'm hoping that this case helps. I'm hoping that you'll get the word out and think about this. And I think we have to honor our elders and let them live their final days enjoying what they've, what they've earned and what they so richly deserve. And that's to, like Mrs. Astor did, pass away peacefully and with dignity. And thank you very much. Let's uh, thank everyone that was a part of the plenary again. Thank you so much. What a, we're really short on time, so I apologize to the panel members. We're not going to be able to get to questions and answers in here. But outside of this room, uh, Ms. Gordon is going to be out there with the two books that she's written. I'll show them to you here. They're very pretty covers, right? Very nice. Uh, the Phantom of Fifth Avenue, which is about Get Clark, and Mrs. Astor Regrets, which is about Mrs. Astor. She'd be out there selling those books and, and willing to sign them. And I've asked Liz and Philip to join her there if you have any questions. Um, and, and just want to say um, thank you to all of you for listening and to encourage you to keep looking uh, for elder abuse. Mai, do you have some final announcements or are we good to go? We're good to go. Please uh, continue on to your next sessions. Thank you.